Hi guys, I'm Lena. Welcome to my All Analog Photography channel. As you might know, since two and a half years, I've been working on documenting a construction site on film. I've done another beautiful construction site before and had a book published. I will leave the link for it below this video. This time I decided to take things further and got the idea of collecting pieces of concrete on the construction site, coating them with liquid emulsion and printing my photographs on them. I've been publishing quite a few Instagram reels about it and was getting so many questions about the process that I decided to make an extensive technical video talking about printing on concrete. For those of you guys who watched my video about liquid emulsion and fabric, this one might have some repeating points, but also hopefully new ones. For those of you who are here to try printing on concrete or any other tricky surfaces, watch my Instagram highlights called Fails and get ready for some of your own. I knew the process, I watched some videos, I read a smart book, and I read also a few articles and still messed up so much. You either have to be morally ready for some frustration or not do it at all. Or you can just not be an obsessive perfectionist. That also helps. I was using the polyworm tone emulsion from Adox and you can use any of your choice. The principles are the same. Just the one I used has a nice warm tone. Another good thing about the Adox line of products, they're offering everything from photo grade gelatin, which you will need as a base, to a hardener, which can be bought separately. First, let's talk about the surface for your print. I was only collecting cement pieces with a flat side. You don't have to polish your objects perfectly, but they have to have no spiky elements and no super tiny bumps. Otherwise, you will get bubbles like this one, which is very cute, but super impractical. If you're printing on something gray, then you will need some white paint as a base. I'm using something that I got from a building supply store in Italy. Stuff that you get in other countries might be very different. What's important is that the paint that you choose dries fast. You don't want to spend days on just the base and it needs to have a matte finish. But even the matte finish doesn't guarantee much. I tested special concrete paint and so-called chalk paint, which actually doesn't have any chalk inside. Anyway, the emulsion lifted off the special cement paint. You will have to do a test, uh, coat a couple of different paints on something, uh, use the piece of tile for example, but it can be paper too. Then coat gelatin and the emulsion exactly like you would do normally. So I took out a tiny piece of emulsion and melted it in a jar in daylight and coated in daylight too. So you don't need to obsess about all this like uh, light isolation, you know? And then I went through all the steps of the processing, developer, hardener, fixer under normal light just to see where the emulsion lifts or not. Uh, that's my test from a year ago when I coated everything under red light and exposed properly. Now I'm smarter and I do everything in daylight without any extra trouble and so that's my adhesion test and it works. So I guess this is where we start. Pure gelatin as the first coat. There are different kinds. I once ordered allegedly purified gelatin and when it arrived I was shocked. It was brown. Mixing it was as bad as I expected. It was stinking horribly. So otherwise it performed and I still have some prints made on this gelatin coating, but I would never voluntarily use it again. This gelatin from Adox is, as uh, you can see, my happy face, very clear and odorless. You have to mix approximately 40 grams per liter. It can be slightly more too, just not less. One very full 35 millimeter film container is exactly 10 grams. So I'm usually mixing slightly more than half of the container with 125 milliliters of water. Mixing gelatin only looks fun on social media. In reality, it's a super long process, especially if you don't have a magnetic stirrer, which I don't. I actually do. I haven't just unpacked it yet. So to make it a bit more tolerable, you should first soak the gelatin in cold water for like a half hour, like in a little, little amount of water which just covers the gelatin. After about half an hour, you can add the remaining water hot. I'm using 55 to 60 degrees, nothing's gonna happen, it's not the emulsion, it's not gonna fog or anything. 
and then you have to stir, stir, stir until you get fed up with it. And then you have to stir a little more. And then eventually the substance should be clear, homogenous. And if you stop stirring, the gelatin will clump together at the bottom of the jar and good luck getting it off. So that the gelatin attaches better to the surface, I'm adding hardener into it. This is totally optional, but that's a good moment to address hardeners in general. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do a proper YouTube video instead of answering Instagram comments, because I don't want beginners to just, you know, read some name of a chemical online and then run and bite without approaching handling responsibly. Real professionals doing emulsions that I talked to said formalin is the best and strongest, which is certainly is uh, however it is also the most dangerous to handle i personally was getting slightly nervous around it the adox emh1 which stands for emulsion hardener uses chromalum which is on its own of rather low toxicity and is already diluted in the bottle and you have to dilute it on top do wear gloves as it's pretty acidic but you're not getting some severe damage if you accidentally spill it on yourself you know i personally just went to a regular chemical pharmacy and bought pure chromalum. Now, if you do liquid emulsion at home, especially if you have children, having chromalum in pure form around the house is certainly not the way to go. Also, if you're uncomfortable with handling pure chemicals, just get the EMH1, which is already mixed and diluted for you and has a child-proof cap. So how much of the pure chromalum hardener do you need for gelatin? About like this much? Yeah, for 125 milliliters. This little. I once put more and well, the gelatin hardened. I could never remelt it again and I had to throw it away with the jar together. And visually your gelatin has to turn from like this very, very light yellow into super, super light green because this chromolum is purple and it mixes with the yellow. So it becomes green. This is what you want to be looking for. Well, maybe I should have talked about it first the overall setup. Well, we're now at it, so we're discussing that. You'll need to be warming up the gelatin and the emulsion over a couple of hours, if not longer. So using a sous vide is pretty much unavoidable. I attached mine to an IKEA container with water, put inside a smaller beaker, also filled it with water, and inside this beaker I put the jar with gelatin so it wouldn't flip and like spill all over the container. Just guess if that happened to me. Now coating gelatin is kind of easy relative to the emulsion in red light. The best results are if the surface is warmed up, then it spreads nicer and bubbles go out easier. Uh, it was ice cold in my lab because I can't plug in too many heaters and the fuse just blows. So I used the one heater to warm up my concrete and the rest was like ice cold. I was freezing. What wouldn't you do for art, right? You might not need this setup if your room is reasonably warm. The coating has to be as thin and even as possible. Just practice, 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 and you'll get a hold of it. I can give you all the advice in the world, but nothing, nothing will replace learning through mechanical repetition over and over again. While I was doing the two gelatin layers with trying in between, obviously, I was also melting the emulsion. You'll need a separate black light tie jar. I will leave a link to such a product under this video. You should not melt the entire jar of emulsion because you won't use all of it. For my 20 cement pieces with two layers each, uh, which were also used several times, I used maybe a third of the total amount, and if you remelt the emulsion too many times, it may fog. So under the red light, I just stick a knife inside the polywarm tone jar and cut some pieces and get them out with my hands in gloves. You can just use a fork. I used the fork before, now I'm just doing it with my hands. Don't use a plastic fork because it will break. Yeah, that happened to me too. What I also learned the hard way that even if it feels like the emulsion has melted and you hear it like splashing in the jar, you should still give it like 40 minutes at least of total melting time. And once in 10 minutes, you should just gently agitate the container for like a couple of seconds, not too much, otherwise you will create too many bubbles. I did that too. The emulsion will just coat so much better when it's like 
truly thoroughly melted. For coating and drying, you'll need a darkroom lab or just a darkroom. There is like no way around it. This room has to have the ability to stay dark for hours with you coming in and out. Otherwise, you'll have to invent a sort of light tight drying box where your concrete or other coated objects can go into. If I had to do it, I would probably take a cardboard box and glue all over it in several overlapping layers photo paper bag material. You can buy those bags online, I'll leave the link as well. Uh, this box would have to have overlapping top and bottom to create a proper light trap, you know? So, of course, drying in such a box takes much longer, but it is an option for you guys who don't have like this rotating door or any other uh, setup. Coating the emulsion is just like gelatin coating. There is no real difference. Simply, it happens under the red light. If you have a red headlamp, like I do, <laughs> or a portable LED lamp, which I also do, try not to shine too directly into the emulsion, however tempting. You know, when you have this tiny little piece and it's all dark and you want to get all the bubbles and streaks out and you shine with your headlamp and boom, it's fogged. So we don't want this to happen. But you also don't have to be too paranoid, you know. The emulsion is quite slow. At the beginning, I was super, super cautious and kept the light at like one meter distance and I saw nothing and that's why my coating was horrible. Now I keep it like reasonable, I don't know, 30, 40 centimeters and it does not fog, it's all fine. At least the polywarm tone emulsion, but I would assume, no, you know what, the roller emulsion and Foma, I think they are a little faster. So, you know, you guys have to just experiment, I guess, but it doesn't fog as easily as the paper, that's what I wanted to say. In fact, it's better not to have a lamp on you or above you, but behind the piece which you're coating. So you're kind of coating it, no, wait, like this against the light, you will see all the bubbles and streaks very well. However, bubbles, unless they're like too giant, let them be. Because even an awful perfectionist like myself gave up on this, on getting rid of all the tiny little bubbles, I gave up for now. You also should not forget to coat a couple of watercolor or any other paper with the emulsion to have test strips. We're gonna need them very soon. So after my beautiful pieces and test strips have dried, I put them into a black light tight bag and carry it over to the darkroom. The first thing you want to do is figure out the speed difference between regular printing paper, like whichever paper you have, and the emulsion. So you don't have to do tests on the emulsion. I did it in a very non-scientific way. I took a negative, did a regular test strip on normal paper with two seconds intervals, then I opened the lens two stops and repeated the test on paper with liquid emulsion. Then I looked which times are more or less similar and counted the difference. So in my case, the emulsion was six times slower, like 5.8 times slower than Ilford RC multigrade paper. But this is for me, this is for my thickness of coating, so it can be different for you guys. For example, if the perfect exposure is four seconds at F16 aperture, so then it's um, 24 seconds for the liquid emulsion at the same aperture or like six seconds at f8 aperture so i hope you guys who are watching this know how to calculate those apertures and stops and everything otherwise i might need a separate video about this but i imagine that those of you who are doing this are already very much past the basic stuff but i'll be happy to explain anything you wish in any other video so leave the comments below if you want to see more of the basic explanations anyway now we are slowly getting to print. No wait, don't jump into printing too fast. You have to have several tests and repeat them a couple of times to be absolutely sure uh, that your ratio, your difference is perfect. Also the contrast might vary on your paper and uh, on the liquid emulsion piece. Very important thing to keep in mind is that the paper is lower than concrete. So you put, should put something under the paper when doing your test trips. So this way the distance to the light source is the same. And before doing the final print, you should refocus on the concrete under red light or like on any object that you have because, you know, it's even a couple of millimeters. It changes the whole focusing and it might not look as sharp as on your test. So finalmente, we made the exposure. How do we make sure that the emulsion does not slide off and stays on your surface throughout the whole 
processing. So it's hardener again. There are two ways to go about it. You either soak your object in the pure hardener bath for a minute or two and then rinse it well with cool water and then develop stop and fix in normal chemistry. The second way, and this is how I do it, is developing first and then after a very short rinse in cool water, using the hardener as a stop bath, just pure hardener, no stop bath inside. I also afterwards have two fixer baths and one of them has a hardener in it. So so if you're printing on something like glass or something that is not as like matte and uh, the emulsion does not stay very well, then you definitely want to do the hardener first before the developer, but make sure to rinse your thing, <laughs> whatever you're printing on, to rinse it before going into the developer because the hardener is so acid, it's going to kill your developer very fast. After my two fixers, I wash my piece in cool water for about 10 minutes, then soak it in Thioclear and keep washing afterwards for another half hour. So in my case, the emulsion stays. Depending on your surface, you might want to shorten the wash times. And as a final touch, I'm bathing my pieces in Adostab. It's an image stabilizer, the original legendary Agfa Sistan formula, which is also great for protecting your negatives, your prints, whatever comes out of your darkroom. You might want to add some other stub as a final touch. And that's it. The dried emulsion is very resistant. You can swipe dust off it if you're displaying it. You can retouch it or even paint on top. So the sky's the limit. Hope this video answered most of your guys' questions and I would be very excited to see the results. Thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel and following me on Instagram. And huge thank you to everyone supporting my work and buying my book. See you in the next video. Bye!